Morning. How many people got screwed up with daylight savings time? That's it? This is the good one. This is the one where you like get to sleep in. Okay. We're going to continue on in the book of Kings. We're actually in our, and the series is called Kings because we're going through both books. Originally, this was just one. It was divided up later. Uh, but we've actually finished 1 Kings, and we are into 2 Kings now. Uh, and last week, we discussed um, Elisha taking the place of Elijah. Now, um, this was not as easy as it sounds because Israel was a tough group of people to deal with. I mean, you had to bear a lot of burdens to be a prophet in Israel, right? I mean, they had abandoned the true God, and they were pretty much just a pagan nation. I mean, it's just pretty much what they were. They were worshiping idol gods. They had evil and wicked leaders. Uh, and Elisha found out that it was really tough having to follow after Elijah. Those were big shoes to fill. It would be like trying to be the next coach at Alabama. Who wants to follow Saban, right? It's kind of the same thing. He was following a man who was arguably one of the greatest prophets in Scripture, and so he had some stuff he felt like he had to prove. So this week we're going to meet yet another king of Israel uh, named Jehoram, and this is Ahab's son and Jezebel's son. You guys remember them, I assume. So uh, this is their son. Now, actually, there was another son that reigned in between these two, but it was a very short reign and nothing worth talking about, so we'll just act like he didn't exist, and we'll go straight to this one. But he reigned, and he was Ahab's son. Now, today we're going to find that sometimes... God's blessings come at a price. Actually, often God's blessings come at a price. And the price of God's blessings generally includes faithfulness, dedication, and a willingness to serve. That's the price. And sometimes I think God expects us to show that we are willing to roll up our sleeves and dig in and do something before he will start moving powerfully in our life. And that's why we call today's message, uh, Dig In. You've got to think about it. God sent his only son. And while his son was on this earth, he was digging in. He was busy. He was working for the kingdom, and he expects the same from us, that we would be busy and working. I think a lot of times the reason we don't experience God, we don't experience God like we should is just laziness, and we just don't involve ourselves and make an investment in our faith. Okay, now we're going to jump right in today. Uh, there's some pretty neat stuff. I love this chapter, but we'll just dive right in. Sorry, 2 Kings chapter 3, starting in verse 1. It says, Now Jehoram, the, uh, the son of Ahab, became king over Israel at Samaria in the 18th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, and he reigned 12 years. Uh, he did evil in the sight of the Lord, though not like his father and his mother, for he put away the sacred pillar of Baal, which his father had made. Nevertheless, he clung to the sins of Jer Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel's sin. He did not depart from them. Okay, so after Ahab died, his son took his place. Now, Jehoram was not as bad as Ahab and Jezebel. Okay, but that is not really anything to be too proud of. Okay, it's not like, you know, that's like being the fastest guy in a one-man race. You know what I mean? I mean, it's, it, no one would ever be as wicked and as evil as Ahab and Jezebel. No one. There, that, was, uh, that was as bad as it was going to get for Israel. They were the most wicked and evil king and queen they would ever, ever have. I mean, he did one good thing for some reason, and I don't know why, he did not like his mother's God. Jezebel's God was Baal, and they, uh, Ahab built this pillar uh, to honor him. And for some reason, he didn't like that God. He wanted that God out of the pagan worship scene, so he tore down that pillar. Uh, but it's not like, you know, he repented and turned to God, because it says that he still followed after idol gods. He followed after the idol gods of Jeroboam, and he still rejected God, and they were still pagan. So he was still an evil king. He just wasn't as evil as his dad and his mom. So, I mean, there's that, I guess. But... Uh, he was better than they were. That's, that's about as far as you can say good about him. So listen, he come into a very, it's kind of a uh, difficult situation for a young guy to come into. And I think you're going to find as we start to read that uh, he's kind of a punk. Okay, and you're going to see why here in just a few minutes. Because when, when Ahab was reigning, he was very evil. And so was, you know, his wife. She was very evil. And so very few people would cross them. Okay, they just didn't want to cross them. They did what they had to do to be at peace with him because they were afraid he would have them murdered at the drop of a hat. They were very wicked and evil people. But evidently, people weren't afraid of Jehoram the way they were of Ahaz and Jezebel. Okay, he, they weren't afraid of him. And that quickly became evident because early in his reign, he started having to face rebellion. I mean, very early in his reign. Let's take a look at this. Uh, 
chapter 3, starting in verse 4, it says, Now Mesha, king of Moab, was a sheep breeder, and he used to pay the king of Israel, this is Ahab, 100,000 lambs and the wool of 100,000 rams. That's a lot of stinking sheep, isn't it? Can you imagine being the poor guy that had to skin 100,000 rams every year? I mean, jeez, this is a lot. So 200,000, you know, altogether, 100,000 skins and 100,000 sheep, uh, or lambs, rather. But when Ahab died, the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. Uh, then he went and sent word, by, uh, sent word to Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, saying, The king of Moab has rebelled against me. Will you go with me and fight against Moab? And he said, I will go up. I am as you are, my people as your people, my horses as your horses. I keep thinking, me casa, u casa. I don't know why I wouldn't. But anyway, as your horses, verse 8, he said, uh, which way shall we go up? And he answered, the way of the wilderness of Edom. Okay, so out of fear and respect, King Mesha or Mesha uh, used to pay this large tribute to King Ahab. And I'd say it's less respect and more not wanting to get your head cut off would be my guess, right? But he was afraid of him. So he paid this tribute without question every year. But when he died, when Ahab died, suddenly he refused to pay that to Jehoram. He's like, listen, I'll give that to your dad. I am not giving that to his punk son. I'm not giving him that, okay? And I think we'll see why here shortly because the way Jehoram reacted may have shed a little light on why they didn't respect him like they did his father and why they weren't afraid of him like they were his father. Because what king doesn't deal with rebellion himself? I mean, Israel was not a small kingdom. But he doesn't deal with it at all. What does he do? He runs to Judah. And I, I mean, you guys remember, Judah and Israel did not like each other. Right? And he runs to him and says, Will you help me fight this king? He won't give me my sheep. You know? And, I mean, it's unbelievable. He did, this is one kingdom, and he refused to even try to be a leader and take it on himself. He calls Jehoshaphat, who is the king of Judah, and asks him for his help. And Jehoshaphat was willing to do it, but it's kind of shocking because he was, the king of Judah was a good man. He was a God-fearing man. And in all reality, he really should have said no. Because God has always dissuaded his people from going into partnership with unbelievers and with pagans. He just, it just never works out good. right? He really should have said, no, I, I don't want anything to do with you. You're a bunch of pagans. You reject our God. Uh, you're out of his will. I'm not going to have anything to do with you. But... He must have had a kind heart because he said, yeah, I mean, despite the fact that you are everything I hope my people never become, despite that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to join forces with you, right? So Jehoram also, that wasn't enough. Jehoram also wants to bring in the king of Edom uh, to complete their alliance against Moab. So he's trying to stack the deck. Now, one thing that becomes apparent right away, and I think it's kind of funny, because when you think of Israel, when you think of Judah, you think of David. I mean, David, the mighty warrior who could slay thousands and tens of thousands and, and who people f were afraid of and they fear when they saw him come on the scene. And then you got these guys. Okay? And it's obvious they weren't very smart about planning for battle. Listen to this. Starting in verse 9, it says, So the king of Israel went to the king of Judah and the king of Edom, and they made a circuit of seven days' journey. And there was no water for the army or for the cattle that followed them. Okay. They were really bad at this because here was their plan. Here, we're going to take this secret route. We're going to pick up the king, of, uh, the king of Edom, and we're going to, for seven days, travel, and then we're going to attack. But it was in the desert. It was a seven-day trek through a desert. And they didn't bring water. I mean, you would think when they were packing, they're going shaving lotion, toothbrush, toothpaste, right? You know, the nasal strips. What am I forgetting? I think I'm good. Water! You're going to go seven days through the desert with tens of thousands of men, with cattle following behind you for your meal, and you don't think about, I don't know, bringing extra water? So they take this trek and go on their way, and sure enough, they run completely out of water. So Jehoram, Ahab's son, the punk, right, so he does what most people do when things don't go their way. He started whining and blaming God. Okay, take a look at this. Uh, starting in verse 10, it says, Then the king of Israel said, Alas, listen to this, For the Lord 
has called these three kings to give them into the hand of Moab. Is anybody else wondering about this time, when did the Lord call those three kings? You were afraid of him, and you went like a little punk and asked him to help you fight, and then you got Edom because you weren't sure that was enough. You put those three together, and he's like, great. God put us together to come out here and die of thirst. He is such a punk. Verse 11. But Jehoshaphat said, is there not a prophet in, uh, of the Lord that we may inquire of him, uh, inquire of the Lord by him? Uh, and one of the kings of Israel's servants answered and said, Elisha, the son of Shaphat, is here, who used to pour water on the hands of Elijah. That's how you want to be known when you start your ministry. You know, who's Elisha? Oh, he used to wash Elijah's hands. That's, I mean, talk about living in somebody's shadow. Hey, he's a prophet. You know, he was the kid that washed the real prophet's hands. Verse 12. Jehoshaphat said, the word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to him. Okay, Jehoshaphat was the good one. He loved God. He was a godly man. And he, he said, hey, you know, before we start all this whining, how about we see if there is a prophet around that can maybe get God's opinion and advice added into this scene because this is a train wreck. And this is the Chris Mosley version, right? So they called for the prophet Elijah and, and he comes to them, okay? And they, they decide to meet him. And the fact that Jehoshaphat hadn't even heard of Elisha tells you that he hadn't made his bones yet. You know what I mean? Because he didn't even know who he was. I mean, at this point, he didn't even know who Elisha was. He, I mean, that had, to, that had to sting a little bit if Elisha would have found that out. Oh, did, did, did the king of Judah know who I was? No, nah, other than they told him you washed Elijah's hands. I mean, that's all they know about you. So this tells you he, didn't, you know, he, wasn't, he was still trying to make his way. Right? So he hadn't actually established himself yet. Now, there's a lot more, but I want to stop for just a second because how many times do we wait until our plans fall apart before we get God's advice? Has anybody here ever done that? Come on, let's confess. Let's be honest. Have you ever done something and afterwards go, you know, I didn't even pray about that? Yeah. Right? And then when it falls completely apart and everything's a train wreck, we're like, you know, maybe God can help now that I've made a mess of everything. Right? And, and sadly, a lot of times when people do that, they don't even consult God, and things go wrong, they get mad at God. I'm not going to ask you if you've ever been mad at God, but it happens. And I'll never forget, I met with this woman one time who will remain nameless, and she was so mad at God, and she wanted to meet with me, and I said, okay. I'm like, so what are you mad about? She said, well, I mean, my husband's terrible, I can't stand him, you know, we're getting divorced, he's never been good. It's been a train wreck from the beginning. I don't know why I ever started this thing. And I just don't understand why God's making all this happen to me. I go to church every week, and I don't understand why God, why God, and I listen to all the whining. And when she was done, we changed her diaper, and then we went into the question. And I asked her, I said, let me ask you something. I said, did you pray about him before you went out with him? Mm, nope, we were set up. Set up by God? Nope, friends. Okay. I said, did you pray about your relationship or try to come to an understanding that God was going to be the center of your relationship while you were dating? Mm, nope. Everything went good when we were dating. You hear what she's saying there? Nothing's wrong. I don't need to call God yet. I said, okay. I said, well, once you got married, how long till things went wrong? She said, right away. I said, did you take it to God and maybe try to get counseling with God? No. Mm -mm. Nope. I go, okay. I said, when things really started falling apart, then you took it to God, right? She said, no, no, I didn't take it to God. It was, it, things were really bad, you know. I, I didn't know what to do. I was kind of mad at him. I go, okay, and then did you pray before you got divorced? Nope, I was sick of him. I was getting rid of him. <laughs> I said, okay, let me see if I can put all this together. You didn't ask God if you should date him. You didn't ask God if you should keep dating him. You didn't ask, ask God if you should marry him. You didn't ask God if he could help you fix the marriage once you've made a train wreck of it. You didn't ask God if you should get counseling. You didn't ask God if you should get a divorce. And this is all God's fault. Do you see a problem with this? You know, the problem, you shouldn't be mad at God. He should be mad at you. He really should be mad at you because you made a train wreck of the, sanct of the sanctity of marriage, which is something he thinks very highly of. And now you're walking around bad mouthing him for something he had no voice in whatsoever. Okay, that's what we do. We often do that very thing. We whine and we complain. And here's the truth of the matter. If we would start consulting God before we do things, less things that we do would fall apart. Let me ask you some simple questions. How many people pray before they buy a car? <laughs> 
One person was trying to decide if they're going to lie or not. Uh, right? How many people pray before you buy a home? How many people pray before you buy anything? Do you find that strange? Do you find that strange? You guys must have a lot more money than me. Because everything I buy hurts. You know? So I'm just saying, we have gotten in the habit now of we pray for our meal, we pray for you know, our missionaries, and we pray for our church, and we pray for people who are sick. But we don't pray for God to give us direction on anything until we screw it up. That's just where we are. It's sad, but that's, that's just where we are. You know, imagine the trouble we could avoid if, I don't know, we talked to him first and said, God, show me if this is what you want for me. And people always say, how do I know if he's going to, you know, when he's showing me? Oh, you'll know. You'll know. They're like, well, it's hard to believe. I say, I imagine you've never done it. But if you do it, you'll find out <laughs> that he will actually answer you. I mean, think of the trouble we could avoid. And I think a lot of the problem roots back to our vision and how we see God. Okay, we don't see God like we should see him. We see God as the one who punishes, punishes us when we do wrong, or he's the one that, that helps us check off our grocery list. So usually that's one of the two things we see God as, right? I mean, there's a lot of churches that teach that basically he's the white-haired guy with the baseball bat just waiting to thump you. You know, you get afraid of it. But the truth of the matter is God is a loving father. He loved you so much he sent his son to die for you. He sent his son to live in a world that would, that would abuse him and make fun of him and mock him and beat him and murder him innocently because he wanted you to be able to spend eternity with him even though you are always going to sin, you're never going to be right, you're always going to rebel against him. But just through the act of faith in his son, he gave you eternal life. A God that loves you that much really wants to be involved in your lives. He genuinely cares about what goes on in your life. He loves you that much. Think about this for a second. Parents, how many of you would love to be able to help your kids succeed? Raise your hand. How many people here would jump at the chance if you knew that something you would say would help your child succeed? Would you jump at the chance? Right? Would you give everything and do anything to make sure that your children are safe and cared for? Would you? Are you a better parent than God? What makes you think that God doesn't want to do the same for you? If you'd give him the opportunity. He's a better father than we are parents. And he wants to do what's good for us. If we would just give him a chance. Okay, we'll look more at that as we move on. I don't want to preach on that forever. Let's move on to verse 13. It says, now Elisha said to the king of Israel. Okay, here it goes. Elisha's going to get salty. I love this. Okay, listen to what he says here. Now Elisha said to the king of Israel, what do I have to do with you? He says, go to the prophets of your father and the prophets of your mother. Now, that is salty. I don't care how righteous you want to make him. He was basically saying, what is your punk butt doing up here asking me for a favor? I know who your parents are. They're the most wicked people to ever live. What are you doing here? Did you get rid of their gods? No, you got rid of one and replaced it with another one. Why are you here seeking me? That's what he's saying, Okay. And the king of Israel said to him, now listen to this. This is his response. He just got a major, you know, salty comment made to him saying, why are you here? And he responds and says, no, for the Lord has called these three kings together to give them into the hands of Moab. That's his answer. Verse 14, Elijah said, as the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand, were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would not look at you nor see you. Now do you think he was salty? I love, I love how he responds to him when he comes to him for advice. He basically said, oh, now you want to talk to me, son of Ahab. Really, why don't you go ask mommy or daddy's God what to do, huh? I'm sure the temple's empty. Why don't you go ask one of them? You got a ton of them. If they don't answer, ask another one. He was, he was salty. He didn't want to help him. He didn't like it. And what's worse is, instead of feeling ashamed or burdened his answer was well i came to you because god put us together to die that's his response he's still blaming god he's still blaming god because he's a spoiled brat he's just blaming god it blows me away that that was his answer and elisha told him listen if it weren't for jehoshaphat i would ignore you and pretend i don't even see you 
You don't exist to me. But because he's a man of God, and somehow you conned him into going into your stupid plan, because of that, I'm going to help you. That was basically his answer. He didn't refuse him because of Jehoshaphat. Now, can you imagine if God responded to our requests like Elisha responded to Jehoram's? Because, you know, he deserves to. He doesn't do that. But can you imagine if when we went to God, he spoke to us like Elisha spoke to Jehoram? Can you imagine going to God and saying, God, I really need help? And he'd say, great. Why don't you ask Jack Daniels? You're really fond of him. Can you imagine if God responded to you like that? Or why not ask your money and your possessions? After all, they have your heart. I don't. Why don't you ask them? See if they'll help you. Or why not ask your peers? You seem to be more worried about pleasing them than you are pleasing me. Can you imagine if God answered like that? Can you imagine if he answered and said, you know what? Why don't you go ask the politicians? Because you talk more about politics and post more about politics than you do about me. So why don't you go ask one of them? Can you imagine if God answered us like that? Fortunately, thankfully, God is gracious and he shows us grace when we actually deserve discipline, right? But you see, that's how he should respond to us by the way we treat him, right? Now, because Jehoshaphat was there, though, and he did love God, Elisha wasn't going to refuse him and he was going to help him. Now, I want you to pay attention to here. <laughs> I want you to pay attention here. This is something that had me laughing going down the highway. I think people think I'm insane. Because I work on my sermon sometimes as I'm driving. Don't ask. But sometimes I, I work on my sermon as I'm driving, and I, I use you know Samsung Notes so you can talk, <laughs> and it just like listens to me and doesn't talk back. It's a great marriage, and it writes down whatever I say. So I was writing down stuff, you know, saying stuff, and it was writing down for me. And I came across this part, and I, I literally laughed because it just jumped out to me. Okay. So anyway, let me take you in the dark regions of my mind. Second Kings three fifteen. So he says, but now bring me a minstrel, a musician. <laughs> and it came about when the minstrel played that the hand of the Lord came upon him. <laughs> so he says, out of nowhere, you want to know what God says? Give me a DJ. I'm going to spit some truth to you. Give me a DJ. He had to have his own theme music. I think this is hilarious, right? Verse 16, he said, thus says the Lord, make this valley full of trenches. For thus says the Lord, you shall not see wind, nor shall you see rain, yet the valley shall be filled with water, so that you shall drink both you and your cattle and your beasts. <laughs> so Elisha's response, I mean, it had to shock him a little for several reasons. First of all, I just, I understand, I understand the process, how, you know, the soothing, I get it. I get the theology behind it. I just think it's funny that out of nowhere he says, I'm going to answer your prayer, get me some music. When the music's playing then I'm going to answer. No, not that. Put country on. <laughs> you know, he's going to, so he, when the music starts, I just think that's odd, right? But whatever, you know? So when the music starts, he starts talking to him, right? And <laughs> here's his response. You're out of water. Your cattle and your men are thirsty, probably close to death. So here's my answer. Grab some shovel, shovels and dig some ditches. In the desert, in the heat, while you're thirsty and dying of dehydration. Can you imagine what those men are thinking? They're going, seriously, that's your answer? We're dying here, dude, and you want us to dig in the desert, in the heat. But that was his answer. He said, I want you to dig. And he says, and I want you to understand something. God's going to fill those ditches that you dig with water. But you're not going to see storm clouds. You're not going to see wind. You're not going to see rain. But he's going to fill them with water. Now, why would he do that? And it's pretty simple. If rain would have filled those ditches, do you really think the king of Israel would have gave God the credit? He wouldn't if he would have said, no, he read the weather report before he came down here. That's why. Elisha knew it was going to rain. They would have found some way to, you know, blame some natural phenomenon for filling that, those trenches. God had to show the king of Israel, once again, he didn't deserve it, but he was wanting to show him that he is capable of delivering his people through miraculous means that make no sense to anyone else, but he's able to do that for people who trust him and people who lean on him and people who are hopeless. He's able to help them. That's why he said, no rain, but I will fill those ditches with water. Now, the next thing that Elisha says makes me think that there was either a look of disbelief on their face or shock on their face, because this seems kind of random, but 2 Kings 3.18, he says, this is but a slight thing to the Lord. He will also give uh, the Moabites into your hand. 
Seems kind of random, doesn't it? Why would he say that? Why would he just say, what? This isn't a big deal. I just wonder what the look was on your face. Verse 19, it says, Then you shall strike every fortified city and every choice city and fell every good tree and stop all springs of water and mar every good piece of land with stones. It happened in the morning about the time of the offering, uh, the time of offering the sacrifice, that behold, water came by the way of Edom and the country was filled with water. So after he told him, here's what God's going to do, dig the ditches, ditches and he'll fill it with water, they must have, you know, I can imagine the king of Israel going, I knew we shouldn't have came to this guy. I knew it. I mean, he's just a hand washer for the real prophet. What are we doing with this guy? He say, something made, made Elisha respond, and Elisha's like, what? Do you really think this is impossible? Do you forget our roots? Do you forget what happened? Have you forgotten that he created us in six days? Have you forgotten the crossing of the Red Sea? Have you forgotten these things? Do you, do you remember the fact that we were miraculously brought through the sea, that God fed us from heaven? Did you forget all that? And you think it's hard for him to bring water to you? He walked on water. Think about this. In the future, he would walk on it. And this guy's worried about it. it just, it's just funny that he said that to him. All right, so he throws in, oh, yeah, and by the way, he's also going to let you win this one. You're going to win this battle. He just throws that in. Right, so here was his, he said, dig the ditches, God will give you water, and here's what I want you to do. Utterly decimate the cities of Moab, lay them waste. And the people hear that and they think, why would God do that? I'll explain that when we get further into the message. But he says, just basically wipe it off the face of the earth. So as tired as they were, as thirsty as they were, they dug the ditches and they filled up with water. Just filled up with water, right? Now, I want to pause for a second because I think... God often wants to know we're willing to dig in before he blesses us. I really think that. Now, listen, your salvation is free. You don't have to do anything. It's not by works. The moment you believe you're given eternal life, you don't have to do anything to deserve it, to prove you're worthy, nothing. You believe you have eternal life. That's the way it works. But God's blessings and his presence in your life is different. There are conditions that are attached to that. And here's the reason why. Let me use this analogy. How many people know the kid whose parents give them everything they ask for without question. How many people know a kid like that? Okay, okay. Now, so several of you have met him. I'm not talking give them a lot. I mean, they never work for anything. They don't have to earn anything. They just ask and they get it. You guys know that kid? I remember when I was in high school, I had a $400 car. And I was so proud of that thing. Now, when you shut it off, it ran for another three minutes, and then sounded like a 12-gauge going off. We would go to the mall, and I'd leave my window half down, and all, of my, all of my boys would get out of the car, and I'd go, you guys ready? Turn it off, and we'd take off running so the shotgun sound wouldn't go off when we were standing there, <laughs> you know? And the funny thing was, was my stereo in the car was worth more than the car. But I loved that car, and it ran forever, and I sold it to my brother-in-law, and he drove it for like another 40,000 miles. That was the best $400 car ever. But my buddy pulls in after I got my $400 car. And his dad bought him a brand new Chevy Z34 Lumina. He didn't have to work a day for it. Matter of fact, he didn't have a job. He's like, hey, that's your new car. Here's mine. I'm like, I want to kill you. I would have suffocated him with a pillow if I had a shot at it. I'm just saying. Think about that for a second. You know that kid. And here's the problem is 99% of the time, the kids who have everything appreciate nothing. Do you know that? 99% of the time, the kids that have everything appreciate nothing. See, they have nothing invested in it. And since they always get what they ask for, they feel entitled to get whatever they want. That's the definition of spoiled. God is not going to have spoiled Christians walking around. That's not what he wants for us. God wants people to be invested in their faith, invested in the faith of other people. He wants them to roll up their sleeves and be willing to dig in to see his will accomplished. And when you roll up your sleeves and dig in, God blesses you. That's how it works. Right? I mean, it shows people something when you're willing to put some feet to your faith. It shows people something. When your words and your actions line up, it shows people something. It lets them know that this is more than something we say we believe in. We are going to give it everything we have because we, with all our hearts, believe it to be true. And we'll give all of our life to it. We are willing to roll up our sleeves and dig in in order to see God's will happen. That's why it's so important. If you want people to know you serve God, don't just talk about it. Dig in and do something. Dig in and do something. Listen, if you should live a life of faith. When people, when people know and when they say your name, do they think about Jesus? 
Because if you're serious enough to dig in and put feet to your faith, when people hear your name, they will automatically associate it with God and with Jesus. They'll just affiliate the two of those together. Because they see there's something different about you. Because you are willing to dig in and actually do something. I hear Christians all the time say, oh, I just want to get so close to God. And I think that's something they say because I'm a pastor and, and they think that like saying it to me will get them blessed. And I'm like, yeah, I got my own problems, homie. <laughs> but they're always telling me stuff like, I just want to get closer to God. And lately, my response has been a lot like Elisha's. I say, well, stop wanting and start digging. You want to get close to God? Then you can be close to God. It takes some effort on your part. James talked about it. James chapter 4, verse 8. He says, draw near to God, and he will what? Draw near. draw near to you. But the first step was what? Draw near to God. He said, God's saying, I want to be close to you. Come to me. Hey, you, you want to get close to me? Are you willing to roll up your sleeves? Come to me, and I'll be close to you. Right? God wants that. He, I had someone say one time, well, how do I do that then? How do I do that? How do I dig in and get close to God? Well, first of all, open up that dust-covered Bible and dig into it. Dig into it. Hey, you don't even have to use the, you know, the analog Bible. You can go online if you want. I don't care. right? But dig in to the Word of God. It's more than a, a homework assignment. It's a living, breathing Spirit of God, and it speaks to you. That's how God talks to you. And if you're not reading, God's not talking to you. People always tell me, I feel like God's saying, are you reading? Yeah, it, you, you're probably hearing from the other team. God speaks through His Word. right? Dig in to the church you attend. Don't just be a pew filler. Find a way to serve there. And if there isn't a way, create a way. Because the reason we come together is to inspire each other to love and good deeds, like Hebrews 10, 23 through 25 says. We're supposed to come together and inspire each other to do something for God. Not just come and do our weekly duty. You know what I mean? Dig in to your priorities. Whatever is priority one, if it's not God, kick it out and make God number one. That's another way you can dig in. And listen, if you're honest with yourself, you can take a brief look at your priorities and right away be honest, is God number one? Because your actions will show if God is number one. It'll be more than going to church. It'll be more than listening to 90.3. Here's some free advertisement. You're welcome. Right? It will be your actions will line up with it. If you do these things, you will get closer to God. Not maybe, you will. Because these are the kind of things God tells people to do to see him move in their lives. Roll up your sleeves and get busy if you really want to experience it. I'm telling you. I also hear Christians all the time saying, I just wish my family would trust Jesus. Well, stop wishing and start digging. Do something about that. Do you live your faith in front of them? Do you share your faith with them? Do you show them how much you love Jesus? Do you share how Jesus has changed your life? Listen, beating people over the head with your Bible and inviting them to church does not make them want to love Jesus. It makes them want to avoid you at Walmart. That's what it does. Listen, honestly, I, I've had people come to me and say, I've been begging my husband every day at the breakfast table, please come to church. I don't want you to go to hell. Now he won't even be around me. Why is it? I'm like, because you're a nag. I don't want to be around you. I've been around you 30 seconds. You want him to know that Jesus means something to you? Show him the love you have for Jesus in your actions, in your words. Let him see the love of Jesus pouring off you. And you know what? You won't have to ask him to church. You'll have to come to the place that you found God and that changed your life, he'll want to go if you just start digging and showing your faith. You know what Christians are good at? And I, you guys are saying, oh, great, he's going to bash us. You're right. Christians are good at whining, aren't we? We are good at whining. We whine about, I hear people all the time whine about what the church does or does not do. And they're talking to each other and, you know, oh, Church doesn't do this. Church, listen, backbiting and whining isn't going to change anything. But you could roll up your sleeves and say, I believe the church needs this, and by gosh, we will put you to work. And you can make it better. You want to see God move in that direction? Roll up your sleeves and be willing to dig in. Here's the thing. Sum it all up kind of. You know, I think most people, Christians, are standing at the threshold of God's greatest blessing for them. They're right there. They just won't take that next step. They will not roll up their sleeves and give themselves fully to everything God is and God wants. Because that last step, the enemy knows once you take it, there's, it's hard to turn back once you've been in the center of his will. It's hard. Right? And I think so many people are right there. God is offering you everything. 
but you just won't dig in. It makes me think, you guys remember the children of Israel, how they were brought out of Egypt? I'm sure you've seen the cartoons, right? If you haven't read it. Right? And we're talking plagues, miraculous plagues, fire from heaven, blood, water turning to blood, frogs everywhere, which had to be cool. Boils. I mean, one thing after another. I mean, God miraculously delivered them from the most powerful nation on earth. They go out in the desert. They have no food. They have no water. They, I mean, God tells Moses to hit a rock. Water pours out of the rock, brings water to them. They say they're hungry, Pop-Tarts falling out of the sky. <laughs> hey, call it, believe how you want to believe. I think it was cherry Pop-Tarts with the icing. This is my fantasy. Y'all stay in yours. Right? Falling from the sky. What do they do? They go, I'm sick of Pop-Tarts. I wish I had meat. So God flies in these pheasant buffalo wings delivered. Pick them up and eat them. So they had meat. Bread, meat, water provided for them. Next thing you know, here comes Pharaoh's army chasing after them. They're trapped against the Red Sea. Now what? And Moses picks up his shovel because he's willing to dig in. And he raises his staff and he says, stand back and see the salvation of God. And the walls, the water parts into two walls. And it's just dry ground. Not even wet. No puddles. And they cross the Red Sea on dry land. And behind them comes the Egyptian army. And when the children of Israel are on the shore, he collapses those walls and destroys them all. People go, oh, that didn't really happen. Well, archaeologists looked at that spot and found shields and chariots and Egyptian helmets. That happened. And these people experience it. They walk into this land that has so much potential for them, and, and the fruit is huge and large and I mean it's just bountiful and it's fertile ground and God says great you're at the threshold here's what I want you to do you just got to dig a little deeper I want you to go into that town that's yours they're squatters they're not supposed to be there you're not there because you were disobedient and I had to put you on time out for 400 years but now you're here that's your land throw them out and they go oh, okay hold on let's send some spies in to make sure and God's going here we go and the spies come back, and one, you know, Joshua's going, oh, we got this. And the rest of them are going, eh, they're big. They're ripped. They can fight. You know, I think this parcel of land right here looks beautiful. I don't think we go in there. Right? They were at the threshold of blessing. If they would have went into that town, it would have been given to them, and they refused it because they just didn't want to dig a little deeper. They didn't want to dig in and put feet to their faith, even though God had done all these miraculous things in their life. So they wandered around for 40 years in the wilderness when they should have been enjoying the bounty of that beautiful land that God had already given them. It was theirs already. And so many times we are at that threshold and the world tells us we need to take a step back. This is too unrealistic and we miss God's best. And some people die without ever experiencing it. And all they had to do was just dig in. Just dig a little. You know, I just, I don't understand it. But it happens. And sometimes it happens to us. Let's move on. 2 Kings 3.21 it says, now all the Moabites heard that the kings had come to fight against, uh, against them, and all who were able to put on armor and older were summoned to, and stood in the border. Uh, they rose early in the morning, and the sun shone on the water, and the Moabites saw the water opposite them as red as blood. Have you guys ever seen water that has the sunlight reflecting off of it? Anybody ever seen that, and it looks like different colors? Anybody ever seen that? The rest of you need to get out. Anyway. It can, it changes colors. Verse 23, then they said, this is blood. Listen, the kings have surely fought together and they have slain one another. Now, therefore, Moab, to the spoil. This cracks me up. Verse 24, but when they came to the camp of Israel, the Israelites arose and struck the Moabites so that they fled before them and they went forward into the land, slaughtering the Moabites. Thus they destroyed the cities and each one threw a stone on every piece of good land and filled it. So they stopped up the springs of water and felled the good trees until in Kiraharesh only they left its stones. However, the slingers went about it and struck it. Okay, so basically here's what happens. In the morning they get up and they look and the light is shimmering off the water and it looks like blood to them. I don't know what moron would really think that was blood, but they thought it was real blood. And here's what they thought. They go, you know, Judah and Israel really don't like each other. It's really strange that they're fighting together. I bet you I know what happened. They got sick each other, and they're fighting each other, and that's the blood where they've slaughtered each other. They're already dead. Let's go down and whip them all and take everything they got. 
And they get down there and find out, whoops, it's just light on the water, and they got thumped. Right? That's a big mistake. Whoever made that call got fired, I'm sure. Right? So, I mean, they literally ran them all the way back to their city, decimating everything they had along the way, destroying everything. Everything they owned, they destroyed it, which is exactly what Elisha told them to do. And people say, why did God do that? As you're going to soon see in Moab, those people, the Moabites, were some of the most evil people in history. They believed in child sacrifice. It was common to them to sacrifice your own child to appease the God. Sometimes setting them on fire while they were still alive. These were not good people. These were evil, wicked people, right? And they had these evil satanic practices. That's why God wanted to rid the area of them. And we'll see that here in just a little bit. But when Misha saw everything that was going on around him, here's what he gets out of all this. He says, I must have made my God, Chamoth, upset. I need to appease him. That's why all this has happened to me. I've offended him somehow. 2 Kings 3.26, it says, When the king of Moab saw that the battle was too fierce for him, he took with, he took with him 700 men who drew swords to break through the king of Edom, but they could not. Then he took his oldest son, who was to reign in his place, and offered him as what? A burnt offering on the wall. That was his oldest boy, his successor. Think about that. He said, and burn him on the wall. And there came a great wrath against Israel, and they departed from him and returned to their own land. So to pacify his own God, he thought, the reason we're losing is I made my God mad, so I know what I'll do. What any good parent will do, I'll kill my oldest son and set him on fire as a sacrifice. But see, here's what happened. You notice it said they were, you know, a great wrath against Israel. You know what that's talking about? Judah and Israel didn't get along. There was a lot of people, a lot of theories on what happened here, but I think it's the simplest answer. I think they got down there, got into more trouble than they wanted to get into, and now they saw someone slaughter their own child. They saw the wickedness around them, and they said, you know what? The city's done. We've won the war. I'm not doing any more of this. I'm done. You brought us into a mess. Finish it yourself, and they left. They were sick of it. They went home, but that was a mistake. See, they'd done everything Elijah asked them to do, but they didn't get the king. And so here's what happened. The king really believed that because he sacrificed his child, his God ran them away. And recently, there were archaeologists who did a survey there, and they found some of the original writings from this king. And in those writings, he writes about how he, his God turned Israel away one day when he sacrificed his son. He went to his grave believing that murdering his son for his God is what turned Israel away. If they would have taken that king, there might have been a chance for redemption. Instead, this stuff lived on. And, and he died believing that he turned Israel around and ran them away. It's unbelievable. Here's the big thing, and I'll get out of the way. After everything the king of Israel has seen, he should turn back to God now, Right? Water in the desert, filling trenches, defeating a sizable you know, army with very little effort. He went back and went right back to paganism and forgot totally about God. You see why I said Judah should have just stayed home and watched Miami Vice? They shouldn't even have went. It didn't change anything. It made things worse. He just went home and went back to life as usual. Listen. Before we get done with this message, there's something I want you to take from this. And number one, it's that God wants to do great things in everyone's life. He's, you know, he doesn't want Billy Graham to be any more powerful than you. And he wants everyone to be powerful for him. And most of us are standing right at the threshold. And something holds us back. So I want you to ask yourself a question. Am I digging into my faith enough to see God move in my life? And be honest with yourself. Look at your life's pattern and ask yourself, when people see me, do they know what my passion is, and is that passion Jesus? When they talk to me, do they know I love God? Am I doing enough to where I can experience the presence of God moving powerfully in my life, or is the only people who know I'm a Christian me and God? Ask yourself that question, because I'll tell you what, if there's ever been a time when we need Christians to be digging in and showing people what we believe and what we stand for, it's now. This world is nuts. Don't you agree? Nuts. How many people can't watch the news anymore? Me either. But I tell you what, there are millions of Christians around this country 
who are standing at the threshold of greatness with God, if we would just turn off the news, shut off the social media, and actually pick up a shovel and do something for God, you wouldn't, you wouldn't believe how we could change things. I'm going to go ahead and stop there. We'll pick up there next week. I'm going to ask if you would to please bow your heads. If this is your first time, we always like to give a brief invitation. And here's why. We just believe the word of God's powerful. I can remember listening to a sermon, and to be honest with you, I, don't, I can't really remember the subject matter other than the fact that there were three Hebrew children being thrown in a fire. And they talked about this man, this fourth man that they saw in the fire with them. And you know what? None of that made sense to me, but I bawled like a child. And that was the first time I knew God was calling. I didn't know why. I didn't even understand what they were just talking about. But sometimes God speaks to you through his word. And when he does, you need to respond. If there's someone here who's not sure where they stand, while every head is bowed, just make eye contact, put your head right back down. Bless those people. I'm not going to point you out. I'm not going to chase you down. I'm just going to pray for you. Bless those people. I've been there. I've been there. But he's calling for a reason. Bless those people. Believers, I'm, you know, I'm going to pray for us. If you're watching, listening online, God knows your heart. But believers, I, I really want to pray for us because if there's ever been a time that we need to stand out, it's now. I feel like Christians are becoming invisible and mixing into everything else. And this is a time we need to stand out, and not by our bitter words and our bickering and fighting, but by how much we can love people, whether we agree with them or not. Now's the time. Now's the time we need to roll up our sleeves and dig in more than ever. So I'll pray for us as well. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for all that you do. I just thank you for your love and your mercy and your compassion. I just, I can't understand how you can love people like us. You knew before you ever sent your son, we would never be perfect. We would always make mistakes, but you loved us despite that. And you sent your son to take our place, to pay our sin debt so that all we'd have to do is trust in what he did as full payment for our eternal life. And you promised you'd give it to us. It's supposed to be easy but it was sure difficult for him. I just pray, God, that there's someone here who doesn't know you, that whatever's holding them back, you remove it and let them trust in his promise. If they make that decision, I pray they would contact us. But God, for those of us who are believers, please don't let us fade into the mix. Don't let us be invisible when times are tough. God, let us realize that we're standing at the threshold and give us the strength to roll up our sleeves and step across it. God, we want to make a difference. We don't care if our names are known. We just want your name to be known. Use us in a mighty and powerful way to change our, our communities and our country. We thank you, God, for all that you do. We ask you to go with us as we leave here and keep us safe. But most importantly, Lord, if you don't return to take us home before we meet again, we just pray we would come together one more time and give you all the praise, honor, and glory you're so worthy of. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.